My wife miscarried. I'm facing it like a man, like a man in Christ. I'm comforting her, praying for her, praying with her, leaning into the comfort of my local body, uh, my local church, um, and really just allowing God to be our comforter and really walk me through just a fresh at a deeper level. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. I thought it would be good. I thought it might be good for you guys to kind of hear some of those, some of these meditations and who knows, prayerfully might even build some of you guys up. Uh, so without further ado, let's get in to this episode of uh, EMS emergency medical scriptures. Um, and so, yeah, this is why I was away for two weeks or so. Uh, if any of you guys, if any of you guys did watch my latest Bible study in Luke, uh, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll put the card up in the video here. Um, oh yeah, I, I titled it like the thumbnail was something like, why do you listen to Jesus if you hate him type thing? Right. Um, and I, and I spoke a little bit on, you know, some of the, some of the pain of that and kind of how God's, um, you know, it's kind of working in my heart and being a comforter towards me and my wife right now in this time. Uh, I didn't get into it too deep just because, you know, we were in Luke. And I didn't want to uh, take away from Luke. And also, it's a topic that really needs its own uh, discussion. You know, one of the things that me and my wife have really been glorying in God in right now, I mean, there's a lot, surprisingly, to some of you maybe there's a lot that we've actually been able to thank God for in this season but one of the first things that came to my mind was wow like this hurts this really hurts at the like in the deep part of my soul but while I do have questions for God I don't really have an attitude of questioning you get what I'm saying? Like, I've, I've got many curiosities about this time in life, but it's only really, like, it's served to kind of create a deeper trust in the generosity of the Father and the provision of Jesus Christ. And, you know, one of the things I was thanking God for a lot was, I was just, you know, saying thank you, God, for training me up in the actual word not in church traditions not in the teachings of men called doctrine but in the true doctrine right the faith once for all delivered to the saints thank you god for making me and my wife solid in that because even as soon as we got the news that you know, that she was having a miscarriage due to um, an anembryonic uh, pregnancy. I knew I'm not going anywhere. Like, I mean, I guess because I am going somewhere, I'm running to the foot of the cross. You know, like I'm running to the shadow of the Almighty to be my help and shelter in this time of need. And I trust him. You know, he's the king of life. He's the king of life. All right. And right now, yeah, I'm looking at death in the face, but he's the king of life who loves me and wants to give me good things. You know, like if I'm walking through this, some things I know because of the cross of Jesus, right? And if you, if any of you listening to this have walk through a miscarriage are walking through a miscarriage or some other you know tragedy loss of life type scenario and you're in the faith right um just some things that i really want to clear up you know like god's the author of life he's the king of life all right you gotta cling to that you know like like let him really teach that to you in this season all right don't go down the road of thinking that God's punishing you for something, right? Don't go down the road of, of thinking like that. Um, just 
bear, bear with me real quick. I'm, I'm trying to flip. Uh, I'm trying to turn to a, to a certain scripture here. Because um, this was just, by the way, this was not at all like a polished type video. Like I know some places I want to go um, in this video, but this this thing is not a. It's not like one of my more polished um, videos for sure. For sure. Um, I mean, it tells us in, in Thessalonians that it's not for the sons of God to suffer wrath. It's not for us. It's not for us. You know, all that wrath was absorbed on the cross, paid for already, right? So this tragedy that you're walking through is not happening to you because God is punishing you, you know? Could God use it for disciplinary purposes? Sure, you know, but discipline and wrath are two very different things. Two very different things. <gasps> Excuse me. Right, so don't get to thinking that God's punishing you. All right, don't don't, don't get to thinking like that. All right, because the second you start thinking like that, you're you're not properly appropriating the mercy of God as revealed to you in your Savior, Jesus Christ. In your Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? That being said, though, um, it, it does lead it does lead one to, to wonder, you know, like, like why it, it can lead some to wonder, like, why do bad things happen? Right? Why do bad things happen at all? All right. And Again, this is one of those moments, this is one of those moments for me where I just had to praise God and say, thank you, God, for already giving me, if not the specific answer for my circumstance, then at least the framework of an answer, you know, a framework, a system to be able to really understand this through. Thank you, God, for teaching me enough of your actual word that when something like this did hit my life. It didn't shake me. It didn't shake me. Did it hurt? Yes. Does it still hurt? Yes. Do I still mourn for the fact that I'm not going to be able to meet this person for some time? Yeah. Yeah. Does it hurt that I, that it happened so early? I don't even know the gender of this kid. Yeah. Yeah. It hurts. It hurts. You know, there are some times when I'm on when I'm on the ambulance. You know, we're back at the station between between calls. And yeah, I just kind of got to get alone for a few minutes, you know, and just really feel that sorrow and pain afresh, you know, shed some tears, cry before my father. But I mean, there's a world of difference between that, acknowledging the pain, feeling the pain, because in the shadow of the cross, you have the freedom to feel the pain of a broken world. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that, Christian. But in the shadow of the cross, you have the freedom and the right to say to your father, this hurts. This sucks. This is terrible. You've got the freedom to cry. You've got the freedom to cry. You've got the freedom to not be okay. You've got that, all right? To act like there's anything else, to act like it would be anything different, would be an affront to the cross of Jesus Christ. It would be an affront to the cross of Jesus Christ. And it would be a stumbling block to you accessing the rest of Jesus. Accessing the spiritual Sabbath rest of Jesus at any time you want as your new spiritual birthright as a child of God, as a saint of Christ Jesus. You've got the freedom to not be okay in the shadow of the cross. All right? It's just facts. There's a huge difference between that, though, and saying, I'm leaving the faith because this bad thing happened to me. Right? This one's healthy. This one's not. You know? And also, this is one of those things where I just have to say again, like, like you gotta, you gotta be sure that you're reading your Bible during the peace times of your life, 
Because when you're in the midst of battle, when you're in the midst of just a bomb being dropped on your life, like, I mean, yeah, sure, there are plenty of people that when that happens, that's the final thing that pushes them in to actually seeing what the scriptures have to say. And if that's you, you know, go for it, you know. But if you're living in a peacetime right now, Christian or unbeliever, if nothing's going wrong in your life, Consider it a blessing from God because it is and use that peace time to see what the Bible has to say about good times and bad About good times and bad, right? I mean, that's what that's what Paul kind of tells us to do, right? Um, Philippians, I mean I could quote it from memory, but I do actually really prefer reading it off the page for you guys You know uh, Philippians 4 um, you know, Paul speaking, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. He's talking to the Philippian church and saying, hey, thank you guys for that concern you had for me for reviving it while I'm in while I'm in prison. He goes on to say, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. You know, and I can say with full confidence that walking through this situation has actually shown to me that God made me more content in him than even I thought that I was up to this point. And that's pretty amazing to me. You know, to me, that's that's some evidence of the supernatural right there. I didn't even realize I was this rooted until now. Paul says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. All right? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Doesn't mean jump off a roof and fly. That's not what that's talking about. He's saying all things between plenty and hunger, abundance and need. All things on the spectrum of abundance all the way down to need and back again. All things along that spectrum I can do and I can endure through Christ in me who strengthens me. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. Question, have you let God train you? Have you come to God and asked him, God, how do I get brought low successfully? What does that mean? What does it mean to be brought low successfully? What does it mean to be brought to abundance successfully? What does it mean? I mean, just taking the abundance question right now, a lot of us think that if, you're just, that if you just get to abundance, you've succeeded. Not according to the way Paul words this here. He says, I know how to abound. Which makes it sound like there's a way to abound that's wrong. And there's a way to abound that glorifies Christ. And the same is true on the opposite end of the scale. I know how to be brought low. There's a way of being brought low that glorifies Christ. And there's a way of being brought low that doesn't glorify Christ. Alright, so leads to the question. How do you glorify Christ in being brought low? Good question. Thanks for asking. The answer, I mean, the answer is in quite a few places across the Bible and the New Testament. But um, you could just look to the Sermon on the Mount, you know. And I do praise God for this, you know. Like, it's not up on the church's YouTube channel yet. But whenever it is, you know, I'll have to make a reminder to myself to come back to this video and put the you know, the link up here for you guys to, for you guys to go watch our Sunday sermon on this. But it's in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Right? Blessed are those who mourn. And what is it that they're mourning, right? They are mourning. They are deeply grieving over the sinfulness of not not just themselves but the sinful brokenness of the creation that we exist in right right i mean this brings us back to this brings us back to genesis you know 
Let's bring us back to Genesis. You know, Genesis 1, you know, just all sorts of, just over and over again, God saying, I made it good. I made it good. I made it good. God saw that it was good, everything that he'd made. And then God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Right? That extends even to the anembryonic miscarriage that me and my wife are walking through right now. You know? Anembryonic, all right? Embryo with an A in front of it means pregnancy without embryo, you know, medical terminology, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, the, the, the sperm fertilizes the egg, they do meet, and so biblically, scientifically, we're talking about a human being here that was alive for a couple weeks, but... Most likely due to some chromosomal defects or whatever. Um, you know, uh, the body didn't want to carry it to term. It either got reabsorbed or fully... Well, actually, no, I know in her case it got passed instead of, uh, instead of reabsorbed. Um, but either way, we're talking about a human here, all right? A human that my Bible tells me was made in the image of God, even as tiny and not as developed as myself at that time, God's image stamped on that little one. God's image being stamped on that little one. And one day I'll get to see the image of God on that little one in time. In time, when Jesus comes in his kingdom, I will meet this person. And I am actually quite excited for that. Quite excited for that. I like to think, you know, in heaven, you know, in heaven, in the Lord's presence, you know. They at least get the joy of being able to be part of the cloud of witnesses mentioned in Hebrew, perhaps. Mentioned in Hebrews, perhaps. And saying hey that's my mom and dad down there i don't get it i don't get to talk to them yet because i came up here before they did but look at them down there serving this king that i know with fervor with joy this king that they haven't seen yet i can't wait for them to get up here and worship this king together i look forward to that day i look forward to that day you know, but, you know, if the Bible opens and says, hey, the world was made good. If the world was made good, why am I going through this right now? You know, it's a question that runs through everyone's brain when they're facing tragedy. Yeah, if God is good and if he doesn't do wrong and if the world was made perfectly, why am I walking through this situation? Which clearly is not perfect well, what does the bible say what went wrong what went wrong with god's good world what went wrong with it what went wrong with it oh, oh and i just want to say here at the end of genesis 1 god saw everything that he'd made and behold it was very good and there was evening there was morning the sixth day you know seventh day god rests we get into chapter 3 we get into chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that uh, the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. 
And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain... You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return the man called his wife's name eve because she was the mother of all living and the lord god made for adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them then the lord god said behold the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. That is what went wrong. All right, notice some things about what happened there. About what happened there. The serpent just flat out denied. No, that's not good. That's not good questioned it did god really tell you that's not good for you eve said yeah the serpent said no it's not no it's not and he even pressed the point not only is this thing that god said is bad for you good for you god is only withholding it from you because he doesn't want you to be as he is he doesn't know that he doesn't want you to know that you could rule your own life. He doesn't want you to know that you could enjoy the benefits of true autonomy if you eat of this fruit and leave his subjugation. Doesn't it sound like the thing that atheists usually say? Doesn't it sound like the thing that an atheist usually says? Right here in chapter 3. If I define good and evil according to what I want, then I am master of my own life. I'm the one that guides this ship where I want it to go, where I say is good, not where God says is good. And you can choose to live your life like that. You still can. Everyone does. Just understand that if you choose to live that way, death is what comes for you. Because you've left the author of life. It's like turning the light switch off. Darkness must happen if you take away the light. So too here, death must happen if you take away the author of life. Or if you leave that one. Or if you leave that one. And then look at the, look at the curses. I've usually only focused on the curse to... Uh, the serpent, just because that's the one where Jesus is really exemplified and on display. But consider the curses to the woman and the man. You know, to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And that just makes sense, right? Like, you left the king of life, and so this activity that usually would have just given you life, because according to the scriptures... It should not have been a painful thing. 
bringing forth new life should not have been a painful thing. Could you imagine giving birth to a child, no labor pains? That's what it, it was supposed to be. But we as humans said F you to the king of life. And so now trying to create life is painful when it's not supposed to be. Consider Adam. Consider Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. The ground itself is cursed because of him. We, we usually overlook this a lot, you know. Why is why does the earth suck? Why are there earthquakes and natural disasters and, and all sorts of things like that? Right here, Genesis 3, the ground is cursed because of you the planet itself cursed because of you i did not create the earth with hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions that cover cities no 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 no, no. that's not how i built things you know but you humans chose to leave me and since the earth was under y'all's dominion, when you decided to leave me, you dragged the planet with you. You dragged the planet with you, and now the ground itself is cursed because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. All right. The ground was supposed to be the thing that, with Adam's cultivation, with Adam and Eve's cultivation, the ground would yield for them sustenance, right? But now, again, the very thing that was supposed to bring forth life and produce was now going to fight back against you. It's now going to fight against you. All right, just like for the woman, right? Childbearing, bringing forth life, this thing that should not have been work is now going to fight against you and it's not going to work the way it's supposed to all the time. Same for you, males. The things that you cultivate, to, the things that you cultivate for the purpose of growing, the things that you want to see flourish will fight against you. And instead of producing fruit, you'll see thorns and thistles come out of them instead. Now, doesn't that sound like our world? Yeah, yeah, I'd say that sounds like our world to a T. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. You'll still get what you need, but it's going to be work now. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And to dust you shall return. I've heard a lot of unbelievers complain that life is just a lot of hard work for a little bit of reward and then you die. And they use that as some sort of like, you know, arrow to fire at Christianity to say, see, Christianity's not true. I say, no, the very first book of the Bible already said life was going to be like that because you decided to rebel against your creator. You inherited this broken world and your sin nature from your first parents, the sin, and you agree with it. And every day choose to rebel against your creator. You know, it's just really important that, you know, we start there. If we're going to have this conversation on, on any and all tragedy, we got to understand what kind of a world we lived in. We got to understand our history. Why are things broken? Is it really God's fault? Well, when you look into the scriptures, you see, no, that's humanity's fault. That's humanity's fault. That tragedies happen. That tragedies happen. Right? And before we do leave Genesis, consider what the Lord said at the end. Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, the tragedy of this whole story, right, is, again, in Genesis 1, God said he made Adam and Eve in his image already. Satan said, if you eat from this forbidden tree, you'll be like God. Dude, they were already like God. They already had his image stamped on them. 
Satan managed to convince them that they weren't quite the image of God, that God already told them that they were. And so they followed the advice of the serpent, trying to gain something that God had already given them. Trying to gain something that God had already given them. And they followed that false light right into destruction. Right into destruction. And now, you, me, all of us, are still feeling the residual effects of their disobedience. Of their disobedience. You want to know why born-again Christians are so adamant about you following Jesus? Well, partly because every single one of us has felt the consequences of not doing it in our own life. In our own life. Every single one of us. Every drug overdose I get called out to. Every domestic abuse situation I get called out to. Every dementia patient I get called out to. All of it is just a reminder to me. Adam, why did you do that? Adam, if you could have seen this future. If you could have seen this timeline playing out. This future playing out. Would you have done this? Would you have done this? Considering the miscarriage that me and my wife are walking through. If you could see this, if you could see my personal pain, Adam, would you have made that same decision? Would you have made that same decision? I mean, it doesn't really matter now. Your time's over. But I wonder. But I wonder. But consider what God says at the end of chapter... Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And his thought cuts off. And that's where the Lord God sends him out of Eden and guards the way to the tree of life. <clears throat> now, why does God guard the tree of life now when at the beginning of the story, God was going to freely give them? The tree of life. Well, because now they're in a sinful state, right? If they're in a sinful state and then eat of the tree of life and live forever, that means that they are locked in a sinful state, cut off from spiritual life. God doesn't want that. So, in an ironic twist, God curses his creation with difficult with enhanced the difficulty because it was already going to be there but he enhances the difficulty that was already going to be there sends death upon the world as one of the first stones laying a foundation for the redemption of it all for the redemption of it all because the only reason our salvation works is because God actually will die in the future. He curses the creation knowing that he's going to use that very curse as the thing to redeem it all. All right, And if God's that kind of strategist and powerful, he can definitely work your situation for good. Definitely. All right, And just in case you think, um, you know, just kind of, Pulling this out of nowhere here. Um, I'm going to come to the New Testament on this as well. I'm going to come to the New Testament on this as well. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, I believe. I'm just going to start reading in from verse 12 forward. It's just really good stuff. Let me make sure this is. Yep. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All, even in your tragedy, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is Paul writing this. A man who was hard-pressed, very hard-pressed, suffered a lot of tragedies in his own life. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Just let that sink in, you know? The sufferings of... The, uh, let's just use specifics here. The sufferings of our miscarriage in this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is not a verse to minimize your suffering. This is actually a scripture that is trying to show you the full size and the full weight of the glory to be revealed. All right? It's not saying minimize your suffering, it's saying, hey, your suffering is huge. Hey, the Bible acknowledges that. But in comparison to your current suffering, the glory that will be revealed to you, it's going to make this look like nothing. It's going to make you feel kind of silly for even comparing this pain to that back in your first life. That's an encouragement to me. And it should be an encouragement to you, too, if you're walking through um, tragic circumstances um, in, the, in this season, as, as well as, as, well as uh, my wife and I. Uh, continuing on, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Yeah, we know. We just read that. Right, we we just read that in Genesis three, right? How the curses came and the creation, the, the the earth, the planet, the cosmos was subjected to a futility. Not willingly, right? It's not like the rest of creation wanted to suffer curses because of Adam and Eve. Right? So again we see we see scripture backing up scripture. Wow, how crazy. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Just like we were talking or just a few minutes ago in Genesis 3, right? Curses the creation with death, but if you understand the cross of Jesus Christ, you realize that that very curse of death lays the groundwork for a Messiah to die and redeem it all. And redeem it all. Which is why Paul could look back on this and say that the creation, though it was subjected to futility, not willingly, it was because of him being God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Until now. That's really striking imagery for me specifically walking through this. The creation itself, the natural order itself, has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And we still see that. The groaning of the natural order. And not only the creation, but we ourselves. He's talking to, to you Christians, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit... We, we Christians, we have a foretaste of the kingdom living within us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And even we still groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. The redemption of our bodies. All right, this is part of the gospel, right? I mean, heck, a lot of times in our churches we talk about the redemption of our souls and our spirits and that sure yeah that, that should be the focus but don't forget that the gospel work of the cross is not done just because you got forgiven of your sins all right that's the first step that's how you enter into it all but the gospel work of christ is not done until this body of mine 
is just as redeemed as my spirit man in me is and will be. And that is very good news. Very good news for me and my situation, right? Because it means that I have, that I actually have not just a hope, but a living hope that, yeah, though I didn't get to meet this child of mine in this life, look, man, eternity lasts a lot longer than, let's say, if I do well 90 years down here. Eternity is a lot longer than 90 years. I am going to have all the time, literally all the time, to enjoy fellowshipping with that child of mine in time, in time. And that's one of the things that makes Christianity so amazing is that for the Christian, what I've said to my wife all the time, for the Christian, death is just a condition and a temporary one. Just give Jesus time to do what he's going to do, right? He's still bringing people into the kingdom, right? There's still people in this lost world that need to come into the hope that you've got, right? You might be grieving as a Christian, but just take a few moments to praise God for the fact that you do get to grieve as a Christian, as Paul says, as one that has a hope, not as people that don't have a hope. Not as people that don't have a hope. I mean, when atheists are at a funeral... If they're not saying, well, sucks to suck, they're dead, you'll never get to see them again, and oh, by the way, you'll die too, so in time, all those good memories you have with each other, they're just going to be dust in the wind, and everyone's going to, and they're just meaningless. If they're not saying that at a funeral, as an atheist, they're lying, according to their own worldview, lying. You as an atheist can't say something even vaguely comforting as a bad platitude, as bad a platitude as, oh, they're just in a better place now. As bad a platitude as that is, you can't even say that. You can't even say that as an atheist. As a Christian, I get the freedom of the cross to be able to not be okay. I get the freedom of the cross to be able to express my pain and lean into the body of believers around me. I get God himself to be my comforter, a la Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. And, oh by the way, I get a promise that death will be defeated too. Death will be defeated too, so your mourning isn't even forever. It's just in this life. So, even in my mourning, it's never going to be despair. It's never going to be existential dread. Right? The glorious thing about Jesus is that when Jesus is your life, when you've built your life out of Jesus, then even your mourning is brighter than an atheist's good times. That to me is something definitely worth praising the Creator about. Definitely worth praising the Creator about. And. Lastly, like I said in my Luke uh, video, I did want to share with you guys um, just a meditation out of out of Ezekiel. Uh, me and my wife are walking through Ezekiel right now. We definitely gotta definitely gotta get back to it at some point. But um, let me see if I can. Oh, don't lose it now. Don't lose it. There it is. All right. So Ezekiel. I mean, the prophets just had really tough times to be alive. It's really tough times to be alive. And Ezekiel, like most most all the other prophets, they were preaching their message of essentially repent because judgment is at hand and indeed judgment's already here, O Israel. Alright, so you get to Ezekiel 24. Israel's in a super bad uh, set of affairs, state of affairs, still rebelling against their gods, still worshiping, you know, false idols and all sorts of other stuff. And all sorts of other stuff. And this is one of the things that God said to his people. On account of your unclean lewdness, I'm in Ezekiel 24, starting at verse 13. On account of your unclean lewdness, because I would have cleansed you, and you were not cleansed from your uncleanness, 
from your uncleanness, you shall not be cleansed any more till I've satisfied my fury upon you. All right, so you see what he's saying here? Sounds a lot like Genesis as well. Because of your unclean lewdness, because I would have cleansed, I would have cleansed you. Had you come to me, O Israel, I would have cleaned you. But because you didn't want to and still don't want to, the only thing left is justice. Wrath. It's the only thing left. Verse 14, I am the Lord. I have spoken. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. I will not spare. I will not relent. According to your ways. According to your ways and your deeds, you will be judged, declares the Lord God. It's not adding on an extra helping that they don't deserve. Everything that's about to come down on them in, a, in the book of Ezekiel, they thoroughly earn over multiple generations. Right? And then the story takes a surprising twist. At least to me, it was a very surprising twist. Verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me. Quote, son of man, son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening, my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. And the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you're acting thus? Then I said to them, The word of the Lord came to me. Say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, and the yearning of your soul. And your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. Your turbans shall be on your heads, and your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall rot away in your inequities and groan to one another. Thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord God. As for you, son of man, surely on the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their soul's desire, and also their sons and daughters, on that day a fugitive will come to you to report to you the news. On that day your mouth will be open to the fugitive, and you shall speak and no longer, and be no longer mute. So you will be assigned to them, and they will know that I am the Lord. All right, so what does this got to do? What on earth does this particular scripture have to do with the miscarriage that I'm walking through? Well, for me, it really displays God's character, right? Because this is, I would imagine, I mean... I don't think I don't really see people getting mad at Ezekiel 24 as much as I think unbelievers would be getting mad at it, which leads me to believe unbelievers really aren't reading enough, um, nearly enough of the Bible. Um, but I come across this, and there's a couple of things. I'm just going to go through this thing slowly, just to help you see a little bit of what I see. Right, verse 15: The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. You know? And by that, he means Ezekiel's wife. I'm about to take your wife from you. All right? And one of the things I was even telling my wife that just struck me odd about this passage is the way God words it. He could have just said, Son of man, behold, I'm about to take your wife away from you at a stroke. He could have said that. Instead, he chose to say, the delight of your eyes. All right, what does this tell me? This tells me that God fully understood what she meant to Ezekiel and what she was to Ezekiel, the delight of his eyes, you know, and even more so because Ezekiel's wife is the prophetic sign parallel um, to the sanctuary, right? 
because that's what God tells the rebellious Israelites. Just like Ezekiel lost his delight, the delight of his eyes, so too you guys are going to lose the delight of your eyes, my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, and the yearning of your soul. So I don't think it's... I don't think it's a stretch to say that Ezekiel's wife was probably all of that and more to Ezekiel. The pride of his power, the delight of his eyes, and the yearning of his soul. God understood that is exactly what she is to him. And knowing God's character, one that always seeks to redeem a bad situation. One that always wants to take a bad situation and turn it for good. One that is a generous king that wants to share his kingdom with even unworthy subjects to the max. For a king like that to come to Ezekiel and say, I'm about to take the delight of your eyes. Yeah, that gift that I gave to you that it even pleased my heart to give you way back then on your wedding day. I'm going to take it back. It's definitely not because Ezekiel did anything wrong. Again, it's because of the sin of another. I just find that to be just an interesting parallel to the Genesis account yet again. Why is this tragedy befalling you? Because God's doing something here. God's doing something here. He's using Ezekiel as his whiteboard, to reach out to his lost children, the nation of Israel. It's using Ezekiel's life as a sign. Not something I see terribly often in the scriptures, by the way. I mean, the prophets do perform signs a lot, but I don't think I'd ever seen a passage say, you know, it'll say, you know, thus Moses will give to you a sign, or thus, you know, Elijah will perform this sign. It's... It's never something like, Ezekiel, thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. The man himself is the sign. The man himself is the sign. There's something about Ezekiel's mourning and what God is going to say to it that will reveal the glory of God to a lost and dying world around him. To a lost and dying world around him. And Ezekiel's you know, charge was not easy. Sigh. But not allowed. Make no mourning for the dead. You know? Look, we at least got to do that. But because of the dire spiritual situation that Israel was in, Ezekiel couldn't even mourn outwardly. He could internally, but not outwardly. Not for a time. Not for a time. He had to truly lean on God being his comfort in this situation in this situation. And why did God do it? Did he do it for a flippant reason? Did God take Ezekiel's wife back for a flippant reason? For a casual reason? No. We know the reason. Verse 24. Thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes... Then you will know that I am the Lord God. And again, in verse 27, So you will be assigned to them, and they will know that I am the Lord. And they will know that I am the Lord. Right? Why was this passage such a comfort to me? One, God understands the value of life. He understands the value of a life. Corollary to one. God understands the value of that life in my eyes. It's not just that God understands the true value of that life. He also understands my valuation of that life. And how much I care. Right? Right? Again, son of man, behold... I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. I know what she is to you. I'm about to take her away. It's really comforting to me. This is not, I mean, God is transcendent, but he's not just transcendent. He's also imminent. And you see both of that on display here. I'm transcendent enough to take your wife from you at a stroke, but I'm close enough to you to know that your wife is the delight of your eyes. I know what she is to you. 
I know what she is to you. Two. God does tell him not to make any noise, but he does tell him to sigh. All right? And seeing as Ezekiel's situation is rather unique in the annals of human history, right? This is a God that prefers his people to mourn when tragedies do happen. Not to stand stoically and not show any emotion. The only reason Ezekiel couldn't was because he was doing a one-man enactment of what the people of Israel were about to go through as a people. As a people. And even that wasn't permanent. Once, you know, once the runner came or once the once he opened his mouth to the fugitive, then Ezekiel could speak and go about his proper mourning process, you know. This is a God that wants his people to mourn. There's a like a good chunk of the Psalms are Psalms of lament, Psalms of mourning, and there's an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations. A book for lament. All right? God understands there are going to be times when you're not okay. Know that I'm God. I'll make, I'll comfort you in your not okayness. And if you allow me to comfort you, to be your comfort when you're not okay, then what was true of Ezekiel back then will be true of you today. When this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord God. And you will be a sign to others in your life, and they will know that Jesus is the Lord. And they will know. And they'll know. That's a comfort to me. That's a, that's a big comfort to me. Because to me what that means is God understands the value of the child that we don't get to see right now. He understands our subjective valuation of that child we don't get to see and he prefers dare i say commands us to mourn as those that will inherit the kingdom mourn and let me comfort you amongst your mourning so that this tragedy can still serve a kingdom purpose that's really good news. That's real. That's really good news to me. And I would say all of that is quite a universal application to any Christian walking through tragedy and losing the life of a young, of not just a young one, but just a loved one. God knows the value of the loved one that you lost. God knows how much you value the loved one that you lost. And God's preference, dare I say, command for you in losing your loved one is to mourn mourn properly truthfully before god and before your local church family let god be your comfort let god turn this temporary episode of darkness into a light of hope and make you into a city on a hill even in your mourning even in your morning. <sighs> so, I mean, I just had to, just had to share that with, with you guys to share, you know, that, that meditation, that piece of the meditation with you guys. And, you know, hopefully out of this tragedy in time, maybe someone will stumble across this little section of YouTube and, get edified and built up over this that'd be nice that would be nice um yeah that's all i got for you guys um on this topic um what else is coming up let's see coming attractions this week tomorrow i actually finally do intend to work on um that video concerning the bible smugglers in south america finally get an addition to the living martyrs playlist for this generation and later in the week um we're gonna close out luke 5 yeah we're gonna close out luke 5 in the first parable of jesus and it'll be good stuff peace